think we're recording. What's up, Ian? How's it going? It's going well. It's we weren't well. talking before this at all, so this is just a cold introduction. Cold intro on the mic, yeah. Cold intro. This isn't normally how I go contact other people. I just, I somehow get their phone number or their Zoom and I just invite them to Zoom and I'm like, hey, like, who are you? I'm like, <laughs> Click now. Uh, so like, hey, I'm Austin. Yeah, you ready for the podcast? We're going live. <laughs> <laughs> it's now, yeah. It's, it's today. But uh, no, thanks for coming on the podcast. And uh, at the beginning, I really wanted to start with your story, Ian, because you got such an interesting story. Um, going from army, I know you did some drop shipping stuff to reforge to Chicago to we work for the same company for a little bit and just kind of like everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So I could take this a number of directions. The life story. Let's um, go. My plan, my plan is to, to, to do the story of how marketing we met marketing weaved its way into my life. Yeah. Et cetera. Okay. Yeah, let's do it, man. So, actually, you know, it really started uh, when I was 19. I was uh, I was at the United States Military Academy, and I read a – I was on a trip. It was like some student trip. We were in the airport. I think it was in Cleveland. I think it was, might have been in Cleveland, Ohio. We were in the airport, and I saw this book, and it was like this – this guy that was it, it was the most ridiculous title I had ever seen I was like who is this author trying to like crazy self-promote it said this guy was like a like millionaire like ultra vagabond motorcycle racer and interesting so sure enough it was it was Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week mm. and uh and I I remember reading that book and just knowing I was like that's what I want to do. (laughs) Like many millions of people, I was was totally sold on the idea of, you know, just, just traveling around the world and running a business that was remote and marketing. And, uh, you know, the only issue was I had just signed, you know, seven to eight years of my life away to work in the army. (laughs) So, (laughs) And I wanted to be there. No, I had, uh, to truth be told, I'd, I'd worked really hard to get into uh, the spot I was in in the Army, and I was really excited about that career. So basically, you know, that kind of got me interested in this idea of being an entrepreneur. And over the next seven, eight years, I kind of uh, always had that in the back of my mind that that was something I wanted to do. And so the way that I guess expressed for me was I was constantly dabbling in projects, learning about mostly digital marketing, you know, selling products online. Um, For anyone who's not familiar with the four hour work week, a big part of the book is talking about how you can sell things online anywhere in the world. And now that's a good business opportunity. Yeah. So I just went through all these different projects when I was a cadet at the military academy, when I was a a junior officer on the weekends, uh, at nights, I'd be working on some of these projects. And, uh, you know, I did everything from building websites to doing display advertising, affiliate, affiliate marketing. Uh, you know, the goofiest one was the first website I bought was this, uh, website (laughs) birdshopper.com. So I was in class when I was an undergraduate and I'd be selling, you know, bird bass and bird feeders, processing orders. Uh, that was a goofy business sold that quickly. Uh, you know, I just continued learning the whole time I was in the military, totally. just learning, learning, learning. And so, uh, yeah, I did a lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, for this podcast, I'm just going to focus on the marketing, but totally. when I got closer to getting out of the military, I, uh, started contacting some marketers that I followed. And one of the marketers I thought was really impressive was this guy, you know, that, you know, one of our old bosses, uh, Chris Walker. Yep. You know, he had come out, his original stuff was test shock. Uh, he is a brand. Uh, one of the guys we used to work for me and Austin both worked for was a a guy, Christopher Walker, who now runs uh, truth nutraceuticals. Mm -hmm. And so I'd been in contact with him, actually paying him for consulting just to teach me a few things he was doing with his business. Uh, and sure enough, that led to down the road that led to a job offer where, uh, me and Austin met. Yep. 
Dude, uh, so you skipped yeah. over it. You skipped over it. But when you were calling people, yeah. you got Tim Ferriss's number at a certain point. Oh. So, you, so it does come <laughs> I didn't know that that was a pinnacle moment in my like, life. He Story teaches you. Yeah, he teaches you all the stuff about like, hey, I got to like, yeah, this yeah. is how you drop ship. This is how you contact. Oh, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Find okay. his number. I got you. So, yeah. So in Tim Ferriss's book, a really interesting part is – you know, he says that <clears throat> for these influential people that it's lonely at the top and these people, you know, actually, if you can get through all their gatekeepers and get them on the phone, they probably would like to hear from a fan or uh, someone who's interested in learning from them otherwise. So my naive 19 year old self, I just took that idea to the bank. I was like, all right. <laughs> and so I, Somehow got one of his numbers at the time and uh, and it gave him a call again, not knowing anything about, you know, doing business outreach or anything. I was just like, <laughs> all right, <laughs> and called him. And it was hilarious because all the techniques he talks about to like get off the phone or get away from people, he like did to me on the phone. <laughs> and I was just like, I just got Tim Ferriss like on the phone that you just, you just taught me this in your book. Like uh, one time he was like, Oh, I'm at a bus stop. Like I'm about to leave. Like, yeah. uh, it's like false time constraint, and it was just hilarious. So, I still was like very excited to, like, have you know his technique had worked. So yeah, exactly. Uh, thanks, thanks, Tim. Uh, but <laughs> but yeah. it was hilarious. Yeah, it was it was pretty fun. So we were talking about <clears throat> this is where we met Christopher Walker. You had him as a consultant. Mm -hmm. Now you're working for the same company as. Uh, or we were working for the same company at the time. Yeah. 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 So me and Austin worked, uh, down in, so that company was down in Florida. Uh, man. Yeah. We worked there for a little mm -hmm. Austin stayed at that company. I left, uh, started up a couple other things. And again, this was just, I guess this was 2015, Six. right. As I was about to get out of the military. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah man i was uh you were there six months you were basically there the whole time carter was there yeah yeah just about yeah i think yeah and mm -hmm. then so that's kind of an interesting story as well so when me and austin first started working at this uh it was basically a startup company a digital media a lot of stuff in uh, men's health mm -hmm. and uh i was hired and I was actually at the time still in the military waiting to get off a contract. Uh, thankfully at that point I had a boss who uh, allowed me to take on this second job. Uh, <laughs> so I was working remote uh, as a remote employee for the majority of the time while I was in the military. So there would be days. I remember one time, I think I jumped on with Chris. I jumped on a, it was a call, some products. We were like yeah. strategizing for some product while I was doing these picking up some shipments of equipment for the military. So I was like <laughs> BTCing him on my phone and like my uniform in a van driving to pick up. Yeah. So that was a crazy time. Definitely a good time though. Yeah, man. I mean, a lot to learn, but then you went from there, you went to reforge. You had a few other uh, awesome little startup gigs, right? Well, I guess reforge isn't startup. Mm -hmm. It's pretty massive now. Right. Yeah. Reforges. Yeah. So I, so basically when I left a uh, company we were working for, I was applying to grad school while I was doing some contracting, just contract work uh, as a marketer. Uh, so just mostly helping influencers in the fitness space to get their companies off the ground. Uh, I had one, one buddy I helped with the book launch and then while applying for some of these contract gigs, uh, I had someone, you know, tell me to go see if I could work for, uh, this company reforge, which is big in the, uh, it's big in growth marketing. So teaching, teaching, uh, some of the, uh, product managers and engineers at a lot of these big tech companies on how to set up growth teams. Um, so that was a great experience. That was right before I started grad school. I was able to work there, uh, for a few months, uh, learned a ton. Uh, well, yeah. Learned a ton from, uh, Brian Balfour and Susan Sue. 
uh, and people Good that run them. their their marketing team. So uh, really fortunate to get to work there, definitely. Yeah, yeah man, that is awesome. And then mm-hmm. you got into grad school. Yes, yeah. So now, yeah, as we talked about <laughs> the call, now I'm back in school, uh, back out uh, at the University of Chicago, um, just uh, yeah, jamming on code, learning learning a little bit of coding, and uh, uh, still working, doing contract work on the side. So yeah. So we got to dive into that a little bit. Like, what's your opinion on school? Like, mm. do you think it's necessary? Do you not think it's necessary? Um, who should be going? I know we're going for a different route, but I figure we. Yeah. The saw it's getting pitched this way, so I'm just yeah. gonna hit it out of the park. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, yeah, kind of lobbing you that the past about school, yeah. but uh, yeah, I have mixed views about school. Wow, that's a good one. So I have definitely mixed views. I don't think it's for everyone. Um, given the cost today, yeah. this, this is it's like June 2018. I I think it's for few people um, just because it's so prohibitively expensive uh, unless you're in the position to have someone, you know, help you pay for it or to pay for it. I think for a lot of people, it's not the best route. Um, In my case, I do have a situation that's makes it much easier for me to be attending school. Uh, But uh, for most people, I actually recommend a course in self-study mm-hmm. and a course in project-based work, you know, whether that's working for free for someone else uh, or for a company or organization they own or doing projects like the type they have in a lot of these online yeah. courses now. So you can kind of build up a portfolio of your own your own work because in my experience, uh, any job that I've applied to, while my past experience has been very important, a lot of the tangible things that I could point to having built or contributed to mm-hmm. were more important. Um, so especially for stuff where the companies are dealing with tech products or anything that's online, mm-hmm. you know, the expectation is that you can point to your work in some format and that doesn't require school. I know, I think it's great that a lot of schools incorporate that type of work now. Yeah. Uh, I know here at UChicago, we all build up portfolios in class. We all work on open source projects. Um, in the CS department and there's, there's a lot of, a lot of that here, but I also know that there's a lot of programs where there's nothing tangible that you come out the end with saying I built that. And I think that's a problem for today's job market. Totally. And like what you're saying, I mean, with going and working for free with someone, a lot of people are like, why would I ever work for free? You're paying to go to college. So you're paying for, you know, the, the same credentials that are going on your degree or then you're in college and you get those credentials or you get the ability to then go work for the person for free because you have an internship where they don't pay you, which is most people that I know and talk to. And so go work for free now, get the credentials. Normally too, places that you go work for free, you're like, hey, I'll do 90 days with you. If you don't like me at the end of the 90 days, then we'll part ways. But if you do, then you'll hire me as an employee or you phrase it a little bit differently. But you could do the same thing. Like a lot of people don't realize they're like, Oh, I have to go to school because I have to do X. I have to get a business degree. What the go run a business, learn how business works by yeah. doing a business and then talking to someone. Cause your professor likely doesn't run a business. So why are you learning about business from a uh, theorizer? Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah. I hear, I hear that one a lot. And yeah, there's a huge, I think there's a huge difference between the, things you have to think about if you're bootstrapping a business and what you need to think about when you're optimizing a business that's already Mm. in place. So a lot of people who the typical one is people to people say, uh, you know, like, Oh, people to teach business don't know how to run a business. Yeah. A lot of those people, you know, unless they're venture capitalists or former startup founders or employees themselves, they don't have that from the ground up experience that Mm -hmm. is very different from optimizing a large company. Um, you know, in that case, many of those people may have had decades of experience going into big organizations and increasing something about how they do business, whether that's, you know, their profit margins Mm -hmm. or the actual revenue of the growth of the company. But that's very different from you saying, I don't want to work a nine to five job 
I want to go start something else. Those are 90 day difference. Oh, and yeah. if you want to do, you know, the latter, you should find someone that's done that. And that may not be your, you know, business operations professor. So. Yeah, man. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, this, this funnels perfectly into uh, kind of like the mentality of open source and, you know, finding a job in the new economy. So with that, what is like, how do you make it in, in the new economy today? Would you say based on all the availability we have the internet, we have the ability to learn skills, get programs, courses online, just everything that we can do. It's, I mean, there's a, it's a whole new ball game. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So that's kind of, this is almost like the origin story of why I started open source. Uh, let's do it. Yeah. So open source is, a site that teaches people how to get jobs, mostly focused on jobs and technology, but the same skills you use to get jobs in technology, uh, they're going to be similar for most industries. And if they're not now, they will be in the future. So I think, first of all, I think a lot of the concepts to get jobs in those industries apply across the board. Um, so open source focuses on helping people to transition into jobs and, data science, software engineering, uh, internet marketing and design, and doing that as a freelancer, a solopreneur, or entrepreneur starting your own organization. And you know, I focus on those jobs because I think they provide the most flexibility for your career path and they allow you to, as you know, uh, build a personal brand. And mm -hmm. I think that's becoming an increasingly important aspect of managing a career is having personal brand, you know, whether that's being known for your amazing vacation trips to Bali or your, you know, outstanding work doing, uh, reformatting HTML code to increase the SEO on a website. It doesn't matter what you're known for. As long as people in your industry that would think about you have a reason to, I think. Yeah. Um, hundred percent. And so to kind of answer your original question, open source teaches people I think a lot of the job skills that are not traditionally taught by school or by people like guidance counselors or even traditional career opportunities uh, in businesses. So for instance, <clears throat> so one of the big ones is like Austin mentioned, understanding how to leverage your experience, you know, taking calculated risks and leveraging your experience. So to use Austin as an example, you know, he did something at the time many people still would think is fairly risky. He dropped out of a, a good a good school uh, to go to this new startup company that was unproven. Uh, but just like he said, in his case, you know, he had a timeline. If it didn't work mm -hmm. out, what he would do. He had a backup plan, which is a huge part of what I teach. Uh, ABZ planning, which I can get into later. Mm -hmm. He had a backup plan. Uh, he had a best case scenario, a worst case scenario, you know, and he did something as an experiment. Uh, and, you know, came out of the other side with not just an education, in this case, in a very specific skill, but, you know, huge portfolio of work to back it up to. So <clears throat> taking those kind of calculated risks to get those, those learning experiences, really, those professional work related learning experiences is a lot of what uh, the focus of what I try to teach people on open source. Yeah, man. Yeah. Okay. We got, I mean, you just brought it up. So now we got to get into the ABZ planning because yeah, I, that is... You know, I never really, I love when people put names to certain things because then I'm like, okay, cool. Now I know what to call something versus just like, I don't know. Normally I do this and that and this and that and the blah, blah, blah. But instead, if you have the, the terminology, then I'm like this and it comes everything. And then I, you know, mic drop and then I leave. Even <laughs> I'm out. Yeah. When you have a cool sounding framework, it's pretty, it's pretty undeniable. Hard to argue with. Uh, yeah, I like frameworks too. I do like because you just you know, plug and play at different places in your life. Love systems. So ABZ planning was something I was introduced to in Reed Hoffman's book, The Startup of You. So I always thought that book was going to be really cheesy because of the title and just like a pitch for LinkedIn. But uh, yeah, the book, The Startup of You actually has some really great career advice. And one of the best ones was what he calls ABZ planning. And this is something that's used in a number of industries. It's used in the military. Uh, they have different names. I think Ty Lopez actually talks about this. Really? Time, which is fun. Yeah, he talks about yeah. it all the time. But uh, it's the idea of having three main plans for whatever you're doing. In this case, your career. Uh, 
it's your plan A, which is like your wildly ambitious plan you think you can make work. It's your, it should be your main plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, plan B, which is like a decent fallback that you also think will work. And then a plan Z, which is more or less a recovery plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, this would be like if a job or a business you're working on and invested in, you know, completely lost all your money, went broke, what point would you be at? So it's just looking at obstacles that could, you know, that could take place on your plan A and figuring out if everything goes wrong, what will I do to recover and and how will I, you know, so you go into any opportunity in your case, dropping out of school and going to work Mm -hmm. at a startup, you go into that opportunity knowing, okay, this is what I want to happen. This is what I could still make happen if that doesn't work out. And then this is what I'll do if everything goes wrong. Yeah. And the thing that that allows you to do uh, that I think people miss is that is what gives you the confidence to burn all your bridges Mm. to say, I'm all in with this plan. The fact that you've thought through the steps for what might happen and what could happen if things go as bad as possible gives you the confidence to know that there's not really anything that's going to take me by Mm -hmm. surprise. Uh, And Reed gives a lot of great examples for the way people do this. And essentially what it does is allows you to cap your downside on any risk you're taking. Uh, and it's a really good way to think about it. It allows you to be much more risky with, in this case, your career you know, options. So. Totally. <clears throat> yeah, I think that is a good way to approach most things in life. I always like to say it's either fuck yeah or fuck no. And also you should, having a plan B normally means you're not going as hard as plan A. But there's a difference between one in case plan A falls through than like, oh, well, I'm going to do plan B too because, you know, maybe one day instead when you focus like all your eggs in one basket like for me it was florida and i realized okay startup like this is experience i won't get any uh, any time otherwise so wanted to go right work from for a long time if it falls through college is always there i mean and that's i would say that for most people if you're really scared about something college is always there and you can always get a student loan that you have to pay back mm-hmm. over 25 years because mm-hmm. way too much money um but yeah, totally. I mean, so let's move more into, I mean, you started open source, you got 25 episodes out already. I mean, Ian is, um, I'll tag him right now as, uh, the, uh, do I want to give it? I got, you know, what do you like better? Czar master or overlord? Mm. Okay. Sorry. So we're, no, dude, you're good. I'm just talking about you being the czar, the czar of, okay. So, we, we did a quick cut, but we're back. Ian is the czar of cold emails. Uh, <laughs> he can, like, you better hide your email because Ian will find it and you'll be like, <laughs> click on it and be like, huh, I wonder. And then you're like, well, I'm doing a, I gotta, gotta do a podcast with this guy. <laughs> but he has 25 episodes out on open source. Probably when I launch this, you may have more. So uh, there's, tons of content to go devour but all these different people are helping everyone understand these different ways to access the new economy mm-hmm. and i think it's so cool to see all these case studies that you're pulling out of like yeah i didn't like my job i wanted to go do this or yeah i just started a youtube channel and now i'm like this mm-hmm. and i think you're helping to show people these uh these instances that oftentimes seem so unattainable mm-hmm. but like clearly are attainable especially like you read four hour work week i read four hour work week and that was my introduction into this stuff as well and it's i think about all the people who've read it and done something Mm. not as many who's read it but there's been a ton of people who've done something and it's all replicatable who's i think it's uh tony robbins is like if you want success imitate who you think is successful exactly and you'll get attain the same success of course it variates but so let's really like, I want to go into a little bit of like your vision and plan of open source and just like mm-hmm. how this is going to be. I mean, you have open source.com. So anybody listening, think about that. He is open source.com. <laughs> That's crazy. I know most people don't understand how crazy it is to get URLs, but go look up a word that you really like and try to buy that URL. Cause it's going to be ridiculous, mm-hmm. but let's go into open source and really just like, how you were seeing it, how the startup scene is growing and like what, like 
because I think you're going to provide so much value through this to these people. Yeah. Yeah. So there were, there were two main things and I want to give a shout out to Matt at engineered truth because his, he basically helped me figure out the framework for what I wanted to do for engineered truth or for uh, open source, because he had been doing uh, interviews career interviews with professionals in different industries. Uh, Engineer Truth's great site gives people an idea of what all these different careers are. And it was the only thing on YouTube that was similar to what I wanted to do, which was talk to people about how they went from having, you know, a job in a traditional industry to a job in one of these industries that I focus on or to being an online entrepreneur, which is also, you know, something a lot of people are looking to do, just start something online. And so he actually helped me brainstorm a lot of what I was going to do for the interviews. And so basically what I do is I find people that have, have had these transitions, you know, from some type of what most people would consider a traditional job to, you know, being a freelancer, solopreneur, entrepreneur in one of those, those four industries I mentioned, or, you know, just a full on online entrepreneur. Yeah. And like you said, like as, as Tony Robbins and all these, these people say, you know, you can find someone that's doing what you want to do and learn from them. The problem that I found though is in specific industries, there's, there's a smaller amount of people that are doing what you want to do based on your demographic. And it's kind mm-hmm. of hard to envision yourself doing something if there's no one that you know, talks like you, thinks like you, looks like you that's doing that thing. Uh, so what I try to do is get a whole range of people doing a quite, quite a few different types of uh, online businesses and just talk about, you know, how they made the transition. That's what we really focus on is their decision point, how they transition. And the reason I like to do that is because if anyone watches the channel, sees a few of these interviews, they're going to start to see some serious overlap and some consistencies that all of these people are talking about. You know, and they're all people who yeah. are, are at a level of success that they want to be at. So, you know, I've interviewed people from like Nick Robinson, who is the CMO of Quest Nutrition, you know, to uh, like Lolly Palooza, who's a, a, a crafts, she's a DIY crafts expert, you know, already raised four kids, had a whole like five <laughs> lives. So there's a good range of people who have achieved the level of success that, that they feel like they want to achieve and they can talk about from experience what it took to go from somewhere that, where they weren't really comfortable with their career to somewhere where they love their career. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I think that's so, it's so important for people to be able to put themselves in someone else's shoes, mm-hmm. you know, exactly what you were saying though. And I, I normally don't think about this, but until you see someone who's like you in a position, it is very hard to imagine yourself in that position. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's why like when you watch movies, like certain people identify with certain characters and then you're like, what the, how could you identify with that character? And they're like, they're just like me. How can you tell? <laughs> like, okay. Whatever you say, man. Uh, sure. Sure. Dude. But you know, that brings into the point of like, Ian, you're one of the most well-versed in uh, startup knowledge. How are we th- I mean, I remember when we first met and we were in that house in LA or uh, Malibu, um, and you were uh, reading this massive book. I think it was like 800 pages. It was like the startup manual. It was like yeah, everything. It's, it's Steve Blank's The Startup Owner's Manual. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, what the hell? And you're like over there like taking notes and like really <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't know any of this stuff. And like still to this day, you say like certain terminology or words and I'm like, you know, yeah, it sounds important. I'll definitely put that in an email one time. People will be like, whoa, it's the, you know, he's got the one thing it's going, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I wanted to dive into a little bit about the startup scene and like what you're seeing with it, where you think it's going to go. And I know this is coming from like a bird's eye view position, mm-hmm. but I think you do have a lot of knowledge around the way that things are operating. And I know we've talked about, um, blockchain a lot we've talked about uh learned helplessness and how like a lot of times it just seems like things are growing so out of control that we don't know what to do Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so you started with the startup scene and then said Mm -hmm. things are growing so out of control that we don't know what to do so i feel like we could focus on either of those which one (laughs) 
let's go let's let's start with the startup scene and then let's dive a little bit into the learned helplessness like where society's going type thing yes yeah so the startup scene so i kind of got into startups and specifically technology startups when i was maybe the second year i was in the military uh i just started listening to startup school y combinator startup school podcast and then a few years later when uh peter diamandis started doing his exponential wisdom podcast i started listening to it and i guess i just started realizing that the advancements these big technology companies were making or even some of the startups trying to work on these revolutionary technologies were really pushing the direction of uh you know our world i guess more than mm-hmm. any other singular force i guess that i could think of it seemed yeah. like the direction of technology was the direction of the world so i figured that learning about it would be you know important so i do think i pay more attention to technology than a lot of marketers uh, you know in yeah silicon valley or in any technology circles i certainly wouldn't know very much compared to any of those people but uh you know i i was fortunate enough like i said to get to work with some uh, really interesting people, especially the short time that I worked at Reforge. Uh, one of my bosses was a, she was a VC, had worked in a number of direct marketing companies as well as at a number of technology companies. Mm. And that kind of made me realize uh, also that I think there is a big gap between people that do hardcore funded startups and regular non-funded uh, entrepreneurial companies, bootstrapped companies. And it's always seemed to me like there's this false divide based mm. on the cultures that occupy those, those two types of business communities. Uh, and I always thought that was a shame because it seemed like both communities had insights that the others weren't really, I guess, privy to. And uh, if there was more uh, talk back and forth between a lot of some of the, the learnings from these you know, funded companies and the learnings from these bootstrap direct marketing mm-hmm. companies, it would uh, you know, be a pretty fruitful relationship. So I've always been really interested in what direct marketers are doing and people that are playing a longer game, trying to develop a technology and a, and a market for that. So uh, I just think, I think it's, it's, it's important to pay attention to both, both communities. Yeah. I think both are definitely, I mean, cause if you don't know where things are going, then how do you know how to market them? Cause you gotta be looking for the future, but I want to circle back because you were saying that technology is what's paving the future or at least the way that you've seen it is like these major companies that are growing all these different technologies are growing all these different things. That's the way that a lot of the world is moving is like, Oh, they create, you know, Airbnb and now people are going and they're living all over the world. And just, I mean, I was trying you visit us in uh, Colorado we were just jumping from Airbnb to Airbnb. We didn't have to own a place. We could just rent. It was cheap. It was easy. In and out, there's no paying for gas, electricity, any of that stuff. And the availability for that is like literally global. So now people can hop around the world in a sense, right? You still got to have a passport, visa, whatever, all the BS. But on top of that, with technology changing stuff so quickly, I think that is the introduction and the bridge to this learned helplessness that we're seeing all the time, which is like people like, I just don't feel like I can do anything. And I think it's that like people are comparing themselves one to these like crazy people who are creating crazy things. Like one, you're in a competition of your own, like you're only against yourself yesterday. Mm -hmm. But two, I think it comes down to, and I know this is what we were talking about. People don't want change. They're scared of it. And uh, I think that that a lot of times is driving these, these, these erratic emotions and in uh, learned helplessness and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I like how you said that, you know, people are comparing themselves to these ridiculous people Um, because I think, you know, focusing on that, it's, it's the best I think in history to be able to focus on your own, your own progress. Mm-hmm. And it's the worst time to you know, focus on comparing yourself to others. Uh, you know, I think a lot of that just has to do with the tools that we have now. Um, yeah. If you jump on, you know, your Instagram feed or your Facebook feed, you're going to feel pretty bad about yourself. Most likely. Uh, 
there's a lot of cool stuff people are doing all over the world or people that have achieved more than you in a specific domain or whatever. But I think in terms of your ability to progress your own life and your own goals, this is like a magical, magical time. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, go ahead. You were telling me about, um, what was it? Uh, atomic printing? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, atomically precise manufacturing, yeah. Okay, I want you to just yeah. explain this real quick as an aside because this was crazy and it kind of just blew my mind at what is possible. Oh, I feel horrible because there's no way that I could possibly explain atomically <laughs> precise manufacturing realistically, but I'll give you my understanding. Yeah. So my understanding is uh, I, read a, I read a book. I forget which one it was. It was probably, man, I think it was probably printed in 2005 and it was talking about in the coming decades developments in atomically precise manufacturing which is basically making materials at the atom by atom level so i'm not i have no idea how that would work for you know different materials different elements whatever i'm no chemist but it was basically printing out things you know anything regardless of what you're trying yeah. to build atom by atom and having that design uh, that the specs designed uh, you know managed by some sort of computer process that's managing that it's like 3d printing on crack and you can create literally anything because you're creating it at an atomic level. Although that would be the, I, that'd be the sales page, 3d printing on crack. And then, yeah. Yeah. 3d printing on crack does print crack. That's like in the front print can also print crack. Yeah. <laughs> we can manufacture anything. No, but that's like literally the whole, like create your own reality. You're just like, okay, I'm going to make a dragon next week. So mm -hmm. just atomically create a dragon. Like, yeah, I, th I think that's really interesting because it, man, it's, it's funny too. It, this really made me sensitive, sensitive to this working in the military and living in so many small, small towns all over the U S you know, living in Oklahoma, North Carolina, Georgia, all over. And just seeing man, the disparity, even with the internet and everyone can, can potentially see the same things. You know, there are people that believe that humans are going to have like superpowers based on technology yeah. in like, you know, the next hundred years or less. And there are people who don't want any more computing technology at all. And they have no idea that other people actually believe that these crazy yeah. things like that are going to be around. Uh, I think that's so interesting. Yeah, man. I always think about that gap where it's like nature and technology are moving so far away from each other that we either have to incorporate them with each other, which I think would be the best bet because then you're, you know, technology's cold, nature's warm. It's like that duality uh the zen that you always need the middle mm. or you just fucking create technology so crazy that it just hops a level and like all the diseases that technology is creating it just cures too mm. it's like a very it's like you're running a right you're running a steep race where there's going to be a gap and if you can't shoot the gap you die or you clear the gap and you push the things together but if you can make the thing on the other side of the gap like put a ladder or some shit so you can get over it i don't yeah. know my analogy is falling apart there but no it makes i think i think a lot of people are hoping that that's what happens with the technology and you know singularity and uh yeah artificial intelligence i, I don't know it's, it's I, funny when you hear experts talk about it though there's a lot of discrepancy yeah see i want it to be i mean i think we need to incorporate nature like ideally and i think that's the way that you can because when you look at everything, like you look at mushrooms and how similar they are to the neuro, the neural connections of our brains, like even just the mushroom itself and how they grow, the fungi look like a brain. They look like neurons and everything. I think there's so much parallel in the technology that we have inside of us that nature has that like, why would we not learn how to incorporate things into technology? I mean, into nature, technology into nature versus creating this whole new artificial non-organic thing that is way harder to control. It's way harder to do everything than like, Hey, I'm going to go like program X or Y or like this new thing only works if it's in soil and it's good soil and it's organic, clean soil. You know, I mean, it can be less efficient, but sometimes like efficiency is just a BS concoction that we compile in our heads. Cause in the end, where the fuck are we trying to get to? It's like grow, 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 grow. It's like where are you? At a certain point, you're like, what do you, what do you mean by that? What do you, I like that though. What do you mean? I don't, I don't want to ask you about this. You said you said efficiency. Sometimes efficiency is like this BS. Yeah, because uh, so I'm reading this book right now. Solve for happy. Mo uh, Guada 
I think he was one of the lead engineers of Google's algorithm. Um, but his son died during it. And so he had this huge questioning and the books like the algorithm for happiness kind of, but he's trying to figure out all this stuff. And when you think about efficiency and what it is, right, we need to be more efficient with time. We only have so much time, all this stuff. Efficiency is a great way to make it so you never really experience time in a sense, you know, like meditation, you can't be more efficient at meditation. There's a reason for that. I mean, you could, okay. You can get into it with brain FM. You can do these certain things, which put you in a better meditation. But the point is meditation is this uncoming of the mind. It's an unraveling of thoughts. It's a like going inside and deep experience and five minutes can feel like 10 hours or 10 hours can feel like five minutes. And I think a lot of times we just associate efficiency solely with time. And I think that isn't true. I think efficiency can be measured in a lot of different ways. The definition of efficiency probably does have time in it, but you know, I'm not going to knock the definition. So Um, what do you envision when you say efficiency? Like to me right now, it sounds like you're talking about when somebody's like almost trying to rush things. Yeah. Yeah. I think efficiency comes from that adrenalized scarcity. We don't have that much time. We don't have that much. I just don't know where the person's going at the end. You know, like what, because a lot of people don't think about like really long amounts of time and reading the clock of long now really taught me to think like a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand years from now, like, where are we going? Are we just trying to get off this planet? Like I, you know, what's the efficiency that you're doing now besides giving clarity in lot in, in life? Cause I love uh, Jocko Willink and the discipline equals freedom. There's a lot of points in life where like, if you're set and you have your routine, you know what you're doing, you know you go to sleep at this point in time, then you do have freedom because you don't have to think about all that clutter. But when you're thinking about how can I be more efficient constantly, how can I do more, how can I, that's like, it negates the whole reason for the ability to do more, the ability to have clarity in uh, what you're doing, your actions. And I don't know, I'm just going off on this weird rant tangent, but I think efficiency is, good to shoot for just have your end goal in mind like you will die and since you will die like enjoy your time don't just always try to like i need to milk out every last second because if i don't someone's gonna beat me yeah Yeah. they're going to beat you regardless because they had they were born into more money or they have way awesome genetics yeah i think efficiency yeah i think efficiency is like misunderstood a lot too because you know, efficiency for the most part comes out of like management theory Mm -hmm. from the, from the turn of the century where, you know, the idea was if you had a factory that produced widgets and you had X amount of processes, you know, seeing how long it took for each processes and what the error rate was, is there a way to optimize that? And is there a way to focus on one thing to optimize to get outsized improvement? And I think it's great to do that. Um, it's really good to do that. And a lot of people have talked about this, but I feel like you need to have those two modes, like a management mode and a maker mode where Mm. if you're trying to do anything that requires, you know, anything really, really anything, you need to be able to shift those modes to I'm looking at what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And is it effective and efficient? You know, is it, is it the right thing? Is it effective? And am I doing it correctly? Is it efficient? You do, you can do that periodically, but I think the majority of the time, like 99%, you need to be in the mode where, you know, you're living as deep in the moment as possible. Yeah. I couldn't help but think when you said this whole thing about like, where are we going with the point? I think you'd love this book. I'm sure a lot of your audience would. Uh, it's called The Practicing Mind. Oh. And the guy talks about how he would tune these concert pianos and he'd get paid a lot to do it. They had to be like perfect. And he realized that when he felt this sense of urgency to like get as much done as possible, he noticed it in himself and he, he started timing himself and he realized that when he focused on going as slow as possible with like each one and getting into each one as much as possible, not only was it of course in his opinion, better quality work, but it was done faster. So a lot of these times when you're focused on efficiency all the time, it's a complete, complete waste. Unless it's that 1% of like review time after action review, like how do we optimize this process? Majority of time is going to be doing the thing, living your life, you know, and if it's not, I think that's a problem. Yeah. Dude, I talk about the three different types of time, biological, chronological, and experiential. And I think 
we rush this experiential time. We're like, do go, 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 go. But like chronologically, because experiential time can be, you know, a minute or two hours could be one minute of actual chronological time. I think that's exactly what you're saying. He was going slow. He was precise. And therefore it was quicker because he was actually, you know, getting in touch with the thing that he was doing in the now. And it may have felt longer to him, but it wasn't. I think that's the whole slow. It's the stress learning. Cause uh, I mean, I always relate back to a research paper I wrote on uh, stress induced neurons mm-hmm. and they learn, they do learn. But the thing is, I think they're learning at a different type of learning. It's almost like if you learn because you're self-motivated, you know your shit. But if you learn because someone's yelling at you, you, you know the surface level of what it is, but you haven't cognitively thought through what is actually going on. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's where that comes into play. But yeah, it's so... I'm Okay, the practicing mind. Yeah. Yeah. This is audio book. It's really good. I'm going to read it. I'm trying this new thing where I like read a book and then I'll get the audio book and listen to it again to reframe the information. I'm so bad right now. I'm just doing like two times speed audio books. Dude, I mean, I do that too. <laughs> Talk about rushing. Yeah. On my meditations, I have two X speed guided meditations. I'm like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm locked in. I had to, I had to do it because one of the guys I had interviewing is guy Milititis. He's a CS computer science researcher over in Greece. Yeah. And he was, he's like, you got to get to three times. He's like, there's no way to listen to audiobooks with three X speed. So I'm mm-hmm. like trying to see if I can even do it now. Try, if you ever get the email course, Dean Jackson's uh, email course. Yeah. You can, that's the perfect way to practice three X because he talks so slow. They, mm. like I had to do that whole thing in three X or I wouldn't have been able to sit there and listen to him. No offense, Dean Jackson. No offense, but it was great. I mean, the email course is great. If you ever get an email that is like, are you still dot, 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 like three more words, that's a Dean Jackson email. Um, <laughs> like seriously, his whole thing is like nine months later, it's going to be like, are you still interested in sofas? And you're like, oh yeah, I am. And then you like respond and like sure. the rate's ridiculous. But so Ian, we got to jump into it. What is your higher leverage skill? And that's some type of skill that you've, learned in one aspect or uh, a mental thinking paradigm or anything that allows you to get more done, to see more things. That could be pattern recognition. It could be learning to learn. It could be uh, mastering breathing, but some type of skill that really helps you across most fields. Mm. Yeah. Pattern recognition is a popular one. I almost feel like it's so all encompassing that I can't say that's a skill just for me. That's particular. So I'm going to try to use something better. I think, I think pulling, pulling, uh, pulling uh, I guess r- related threads out of, of people's lives finding touch points to relate to people on I think mm-hmm. I would say that's my 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 most important higher leverage skill uh, yeah because it allows me to be more effective in like a lot of different social and, and yeah so we didn't environments. we didn't dive exactly into how you do the emails, but like mm-hmm. one of the ways because Ian was teaching me how to do cold emails, and one of his strategies really is to go and understand that person. Like who are they? What do they think about? Because like you know we see these exactly what you were saying with Tim Ferriss, where he was like you know these people at the top they're lonely, not necessarily that they're lonely, but more so that like they're people too. And so they're thinking about this thing or they have this cool quirk or they like this one thing. And like, if you understand that about a person, you really talk to them like they're a person and not like they're a high and mighty God, then they normally will respond. Like you'll be able to get a better connection, a personal connection versus just like a shallow networking type thing. So, yeah, I think you're, you're, you're killer at that. That's like, cause when, uh, Ian wrote, he cold wrote an email for me and then I read it and I was like, Oh shit. This is how you're supposed to talk to people. Well, okay. Delete. What about you? Can I ask you, wait, what's your, what is your, do you have one? I don't have one specifically. And that's why like in the, in the examples that I give, yeah. like pattern recognition is huge for me. And yeah. like, that's something I'm more of a, uh, when I, when I say pattern recognition, it's more systems related. So I love looking at biological processes and seeing how systems in the body work and related to a company or related to how a business should work. And 
you know, because everything in life is pattern. So you look at sacred geometry and you see all these different replicatable mathematical uh, geometric features. Mm -hmm. But I love looking for stuff like that. Um, I would say breathing is, of course, one of my favorite high leverage skills because if you learn to breathe correctly, then everything changes in your life. You can experience life more fully. Um, I would say learning to learn because if you can learn things better then you can learn anything. And a lot of that is like putting two X speed on an audiobook. Just, I mean, if you have to listen to it three times, whatever you're listening to it more efficiently, but you're learning it better, you know? Yeah. So I can't say I have one higher leverage skill that I utilize, but more of a broad range of them that like, you know, get around multitasking. So I'm not like split and focus, but I'm more efficient in the time that I'm experiencing. Mm -hmm. I would say. So, but then we got to jump into your next thing. What are you currently questioning? It could be reality, life, yeah. startups, anything. Oh, man. Uh, what am I currently questioning? Man. Probably in probably a lot of the, I would say, maybe there's not only two, but some of the different main ideologies in self-help literature, which we're going to have to nerd out on this self-help thing. But for yeah. your audience, man, I know they're reading some of these books. I know they're trying to figure out you know, how they can be successful or build their empire or whatever. So I, I, uh, I, I recently saw that there's, I, I think there's like two main threads in like self-help where there's like this one camp where it's all about like, you know, uh, having a focus on what you want in life. And I guess you could, we could call that the metaphysics camp, but yeah. people are saying you need to have a be solely focus on what you want in life. And then another one where people, you know, emphasize, I guess everyone who's like a self-proclaimed realist would like this camp but uh you know looking at how things operate in the world and developing workable systems for what you see mm. happening so one it's almost like and i'm not saying there people anyone would say to do this but one it seems like when you read these type of books that are saying you know ignore everything else that's going on outside of you and be focused on what your goal is and another one is like take stock in what's going on outside of you and develop systems to navigate those obstacles and I think I it's like interesting that. because I think both sides would agree with parts of the other ones, but there's definitely a split from my point of view in what people are promoting in terms of your, your strategy, I guess, to, to achieve goals. So that's something I'm questioning is why, why is that? The, why does that seem to be the case? Uh, how do you reconcile mm -hmm. it? Is it one of those things where it's a duality where both sides are equally, uh, you know, equally important, equally well, correct? I I almost feel like <clears throat> this kind of goes into that, you know, the whole argument of, uh, hmm, man, there's so much to this actually, because yeah, that's a good, I mean, that's a system identification right there, but that is like learning to operate in a system is really smart. And I know if you read like uh, the rules of, or the law of mastery, I think, yeah, uh, John Green's book, right? I think. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think it is. He talks a lot about the people who don't, like, go against the big names and the big everything uh, a lot of time, but, like, want to be the second or third. Those are the guys who, like, advance good without, like, you know, you try to overthrow a king and he ends up murdering you. Um, on the other hand, the creating your own reality thing, I don't think they have to be separate. I think, like... There is a system right now currently that operates. There is like, you can't like ignore the fact that things do work a certain way or people think a certain way, but I think you could create whatever you want inside of that. And if you don't realize the system, then you don't even know how to put what you want into the system because everything is a system. You know what I mean? I do. I, I do. Personally, I think, there's a lot of things in life that are contradictory and a lot of truths are seemingly opposite. Yeah. You know, while also while being correct at the same time, I think this might be one of those cases, but that's another thing I always question. I think that's probably the most interesting thing is how many, how many things there are like that, that uh, are seemingly contradictory and are simultaneously true. I think that's probably. One well, of yeah. Things I always question. 
Yeah, I mean, it's like the whole, like, um, if you're a liberal conservative, you believe different things, but then you look at how liberals act and they act very conservatively or the mindset that you would think and conservatives act very liberally in certain uh, mindsets. It's mm -hmm. all like this justification of belief systems and like how they're interpreting it up here versus what like the label is saying. I think that's like, it's really hard for people a lot of times. Because they did, I mean, they did a study, I forget, I think it was MIT, and they took all these Republicans and all these Democrats, and they've been Republicans and Democrats for 20, 30 years. They gave them a questionnaire. They didn't put whether they got the results of Republican or Democrat, and all of them, they got to switch their, their political party. <laughs> they got everybody to switch because they just went, wait, isn't it more like this? Yeah, isn't it more like this? Okay, cool. They just let them, and their original belief was one that's so... It's just a switch flip. It's like, oh, it's this? Okay, I'm that. You know, I don't so know. So this, like, how do they do it? Did they, like, tell them that these were the accepted, like, Republican or Democratic answers? Or, like, how do they? I So I didn't them? necessarily read through the whole thing. And I think it was more of, like, I, I would say with most things, if you lead someone on a question, what, a question trail I guess it would be called you know a thought I always like to say thought trail but this is a little different it was probably like so you agree like everybody should be free and everybody should like be peaceful They're like yeah okay cool so you think that like people should be able to you know move up in society and the economy and like be wherever they should be it's like yeah yeah of course it's like okay awesome so you definitely think that people you know should be held accountable to like who they are and what they do it's like, yeah, of course. Okay, so you think that um, like we should be able to like live the lives that we really want to live. And see, these are all broad questions. Yeah, yeah. But then at the end, you could be like, okay, so you're a Republican. Or, okay, so you're a Democrat. Because it's so broad and you're creating all the answers in your mind mm -hmm. that, you, I mean, either way, so if you want people to be free and you want people to do whatever they want to do, and you want people to be held accountable for their actions, that's both sides. Yeah. As, but people normally don't realize like how many of their beliefs are like so in the middle, mm -hmm. but just late, like marketed different by political parties. Yeah. Everyone should be free. Both sides are saying that. Yeah, we had, dude, this is, you'd love this. We had a campaign manager come in and this guy, I had this instructor at the military academy who was an insane networker. Like, yeah dude world class uh super connector again yeah he's a super super connector and he got this guy to come in that had run a couple of these campaigns for a few presidents been in charge of like orchestrating their campaign management and he was just like i guess he was like kind of playing up the hyperbole but he's like my job is basically to get you to choose pepsi over coke <laughs> <laughs> he's just like it's like because the yeah you're saying the way you frame the issues is like it's ridiculous yeah framing of issues in politics is i think we can all agree it's ridiculous yeah and like it, it makes it you get group think you hate half of the population which is so bs mm -hmm. and then dude i can't wait and i'm like i'm like praying for this to happen to uh, infinite intelligence that a party that has never won or never even been heard of comes about and wins because it realizes that everybody really just wants like some similar things and they'll like be like okay well people could do this or people could do that like these little beliefs that like shape a party they just like throw them out and they allow certain things to slide but we have some party that's never won win and now there's three competitors and the whole political party had, or the whole political system has to reframe itself because a black swan event just happened and we need to realize how can we restructure society because there's multiple parties and finally people start to like each other again versus becoming more like increasing the dichotomy and like, I hate that guy because he likes X or Y when it's like, you don't actually hate him. He's a good guy. He does whatever. But you know, as long as he's not a pedophile, like most politicians. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's tough. That's tough, man. I think It'll managing be, people is never easy. No, especially when you're head of like a billion or well, not a billion, half a billion people. What are we? We're 350 million right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a quarter or a third of a billion, but yeah. All right, so it's very hard to be like, no one can wear pink on Fridays. 
And everybody's like, what the fuck? That's my favorite day to wear pink. Yeah, it's hard to please everyone. And I think, uh, you know, I think there's, I think it's, it's hard to find a challenge uh, more difficult than, you know, getting people to work together consistently. Yeah. Projects. So they have to want to, you have to want to do it. If people don't want to do something, they won't do it. That's just like the basic foundation of like your why. If you don't want to never do anything. That's just the truth. That's why people procrastinate. And they're like, how do I stop procrastinating? It's like, do something that you want to do. Oh, then I wanted to do it. I actually did it. I didn't procrastinate anymore. Yeah, that's, no, that's so true. That's so true. I mean, I think that's a big part of people. Like, I think that's, that's actually the biggest reason that keeps people from doing things that are really valuable is I think the hard upfront work of trying to figure out what you, you really care about is, is, is enough to put people off sometimes their entire yeah. life from doing that just because yeah, that idea of like, I'm going to go back to kind of what I experienced with open source is like the idea that people have when they're in a job or a position they don't like that they then have to go through the mental exercise of not only trying to figure out what they actually care about or would want to do, but what they realistically can do. Yeah. And like, those are some very difficult questions to answer. They take a lot of time, a lot of mental energy. And I think, I think you're right. I think more people just put in that upfront work, you know, just figuring out what they want to do and can yeah. do. Uh, it would save people a lot of time, make it more productive, more valuable, save them a lot of heartache. So. Yeah. I was, uh, when I was talking to Eli Wild, he said the law of attraction still needs traction. And I was like, oh, that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> because that's like, good. it's so that's true. Good. You don't put on the upfront work. You don't figure out your why. You don't have momentum. You're not going to keep pushing. You're not going to create the reality you want to create. It's just, you can't hope. Hoping is fine. Like, okay, fine. Have hope. But put in action and you can make it happen. Like, I love that you said, dude, I opened the email course with, you have to kill your hope. Yeah. <laughs> I totally agree, dude. You can't have, if you're hoping for something to happen, it's like, I've definitely done that for years at a time for different things. And like, it never once worked for me. Yeah. Maybe there's someone out there where it has, but it's like, I'll try to get him on this podcast. Here's John. He's the master hoper. And then like, I just like look over <laughs> and I've got like an iced tea and he's like, I was hoping there'd be an iced tea there. And I was like, what? No way. John How hoped this into this? my reality. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a big difference between faith and hope. It's one yeah. of those things, uh, you know, those are definitely contradictory. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a huge difference between faith and hope. I think you should not have, not have, open things but you can you can have faith that they'll they'll happen but yeah. that faith is is not there's there's a difference and the difference and it, in this case would be you're doing something to make it happen exactly and if anybody's names are faith or hope i'm sorry we're not trying to you know push yeah. you down like we're Podcast not saying you can't at you. you can't be included in something just make sure to put in the action either way because i bet you <laughs> i bet you hope has faith and faith may only have hope it's probably like some weird it's like iceland actually is all green and Greenland's actually mostly ice. I don't know why they named it backwards, but, um, no, no, so no, Ian, right now, what is something that you're obsessed with? Could be anything. Could be an item. Could be a book. Could be a, Oh man. What am I obsessed with right now? Oh man. This is so hard. There's a lot of stuff I'm interested in. Obsessed is a strong word. What do you um, like occasionally find yourself Googling? Or like <laughs> you're like lowering the bar for the question so much every time. Like, is there anything you have any semblance <laughs> of interest in? Uh, so obsessed with, I'm just going to say with figuring out how to give yeah. people, you know, better careers online to be truthful, man, there's not a lot I'm worrying about besides that right now. Cause I am yeah. working with a couple people and trying to figure out like the best ways to get them into different jobs and do it practically all the little steps that have to happen. Yeah. So I'm kind of obsessed with that right now. I think it's exciting. Um, we talked about this, you know, there's a couple big problems. I think, the world has that to me seem like there's potential solutions that I might be able to contribute to. One of them is the thing with learned helplessness. I think tons of people around their careers have this learned helplessness. I've known a ton of people who are like, I hate my job. And like every day they're like, I hate my job. (laughs) I'm like, you're doing, this is 10 hours of your life. Like you can just take 15 minutes to try to Google what you might get into instead. Exactly. Going up. But people just don't, they don't have the belief, you know? Yeah. They don't have that belief that they're like, I can't really change. My Listen, job. man, I'm just gonna. I just hate my job. And then they keep typing; their fingers are all bloody. 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I think just that is this thing where it's like so clear to me how people can you know snap out of that. And so that's why I like working on that. I'm kind of obsessed with it right now. Totally, dude. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So where can people find you? Boom. Yes. I mean, we talked uh, about it. But. On the internet. So you can find me at opensourced.com. Uh, you can you can shoot me an email there uh, as well. It's on the contact page. Uh, I also have a coaching page. And then let's see, is there anywhere else? Man, that's it for now. Yeah, just opensource.com is the best bet. I know you got a lot coming. You got some awesome interviews up on there already. I definitely would recommend go checking those out. Some cool people that you just be like, how did, how did this person like do what they did? And they're just like, this is how I did what I did. And you're like, wow, I figured that one out. See, that's exactly that's traction. You figured it out. You didn't hope you would figure it out. Yes, you did exactly. We gotta get you on there too. I gotta interview. Yeah, man. Gotta interview. Awesome, pretty soon. Anytime. I'm just uh, right now chilling. No, I'm working a lot, but yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. yeah but we'll hell yeah, man. Thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll definitely talk soon, man. Thanks for having me.